everybody in your crew identifies as either Big Mac Burger, McNuggets, or McCrispy Sandwich. But you're the filet fish Sandwich all day. That crispy fish, that savory tartar sauce, that melty cheese, that pillowy bun. Yeah, you get it. Every time. And if you love the filet of fish right now you can catch two of the classics you love for just $6. Limited time only. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Single item at regular price. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. Every day, we rise. Challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in. At U.S. Border Patrol, protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call working together to keep our country and communities safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov slash careers. From the wilderness of Kodiak Island, Alaska, this is Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier with your host, Robin Bearfield. In a land full of peril and vicious animals, humans are the most dangerous predators of all. After a string of closely spaced murders of young women near Fairbanks in the late 1970s and early 80s, the abductions and murders stopped. Troopers didn't believe the vicious killer had suddenly quit his murder spree, but they thought the predator had moved somewhere else. Unfortunately, at the time, they had no database to track the killer's movements beyond Alaska. Only the deductive reasoning and hard work of seasoned investigators traced the monster 4,000 miles to his new hunting grounds. Welcome to Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. I'm your host, Robin Bearfield, and I'm broadcasting to you from the heart of the Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge on Kodiak Island in Alaska. Before CODIS, the FBI's DNA index system, and before VICAP, the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program, States had no systematic method of sharing with each other the evidence from violent crime scenes. No national database existed, making it difficult for investigators to track vicious predators who crossed state lines. The crimes in this story occurred near Fairbanks, Alaska, around the town of North Pole. The North Pole is where Santa and Mrs. Claus live and where busy elves build toys for good girls and boys around the world. Or so the legend goes. The city of North Pole, Alaska, is 1,700 miles or 2,700 kilometers south of the geological North Pole. But the town's folks take full advantage of the town's moniker. Many of the streets have holiday names and stores sell Christmas-themed items year-round. The town's biggest attraction is a large gift shop named Santa Claus House, which boasts the world's largest fiberglass statue of Santa. North Pole sits south of Fairbanks and stretches between Fort Wainwright and Isleson Air Force Base and between the Chena and Tanana Rivers. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, murder shattered the innocence of the town Santa Claus calls home. Nineteen-year-old Glinda Sodeman vanished from her home in North Pole on August 29, 1979. Glinda was a newlywed and also the daughter of an Alaska state trooper. Glinda and her husband had a small baby, and according to her husband, when he arrived home on August 29, the baby was in the crib, but Glinda had disappeared. By all accounts, Glinda was happy and had no reason to run away from her home, but investigators found no evidence to suggest foul play. The following October, Glinda's decomposed body was found in a gravel pit near Moose Creek on the Richardson Highway, not far from Isleson Air Force Base and 22 miles south of Fairbanks. 
Glinda had been shot in the face, and troopers found a 38 caliber pistol cartridge near her body. The medical examiner discovered no evidence suggesting Glinda had been sexually assaulted. Suspicion fell on Glinda's new husband, who failed a lie detector test. Even Glinda's father suspected his son-in-law of the crime, but troopers found no evidence to arrest the husband. On June 11, 1980, 11-year-old Doris Oring and her older brother were riding bicycles together on the roads in North Pole. Doris cycled ahead of her brother, and when her brother caught up with her, he saw his sister talking to a strange man in a blue car. The man had propped open the hood of the car and appeared to be having engine problems. When Doris's brother pulled alongside Doris, the man quickly shut the hood, jumped in the car, and sped away. The brother was later able to describe the man to a police sketch artist, and he told the police he thought the man's blue shirt looked like an Air Force uniform. Two days after her encounter with the man in the blue car, Doris disappeared, and her bicycle was found hidden in the bushes along Badger Road near her home in North Pole. A witness reported seeing a small blue car tear around the corner at an intersection near Badger Road. The driver seemed preoccupied and was wrestling with something or someone in the seat next to him. Police believe the attacker hid in the bushes on the side of the road and waited for Doris to ride her bike past his hiding spot. Once she got close, he jumped out of the brush, grabbed her off the bike, and tossed the bike into a nearby ditch. Because Doris's brother thought the man he'd seen talking to his sister might be wearing an Air Force uniform, and because the other witness described the driver of the speeding car as having a military-style haircut, state troopers asked security at Isleson Air Force Base for a list of blue cars registered to drive on the base. The Air Force handed the troopers a list of 550 names of people who owned registered vehicles, possibly matching the rough description of the car the troopers had provided them. Investigators were desperate to find Doris, but with no fingerprints or other forensic evidence, they did not know where to begin. Since troopers had not cleared Glinda Sodeman's husband for Glinda's murder, they decided to question him about the abduction of Doris Oring. They gave him another polygraph test, and this time the examiner found the test results inconclusive. The test results frustrated troopers. They had no physical evidence pointing to Sodeman, but he could not pass a lie detector test when questioned about the murder of his wife or the abduction of young Doris Oring. Troopers decided to bring in a polygraph expert to question Sodeman. After 10 minutes, the expert left the examining room and told troopers that Sodeman had an irregular heartbeat. Such a heartbeat could never produce a passing polygraph test result. The test results from an individual with a heartbeat like Sodeman's would always be classified as inconclusive or failing. Since the troopers had no reason other than his lie detector test results to suspect Sodeman, they dismissed him as a suspect in the disappearance of Doris. On January 31st, a little over seven months after someone snatched Doris Oring, 20-year-old Marlene Peters disappeared. Marlene was last seen trying to hitch a ride from Fairbanks to Anchorage to visit her father who was sick with cancer. Police considered Marlene's disappearance suspicious, but they had no way to know if someone had abducted Marlene near Fairbanks or if she had disappeared somewhere else between Fairbanks and Anchorage. Troopers did not immediately link her case to Doris Oring's or Glenda Sonoman's. Five months after Marlene disappeared, 16-year-old Wendy Wilson vanished. Wendy was last seen hitchhiking, and a witness saw her climb into a white pickup truck in Moose Creek near Fairbanks. Three days after she disappeared, Wendy Wilson's body was found near Johnson Road, 32 miles south of Fairbanks near the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. Wendy's killer had strangled her and then destroyed her face with a shotgun blast. 
Nine weeks after the discovery of Wendy Wilson's body, Marlene Peters' remains were found. Marlene also had been dumped near Johnson Road, and she was found only two miles from where Wendy had been dumped. Marlene also had been strangled and shot in the face with a shotgun. Two days after police recovered Marlene Peters' body, they were notified of the disappearance of 19-year-old Lori King. Lori was last seen walking in Fairbanks. The Fairbanks police and the Alaska State Troopers now knew they had a serial killer operating in and near North Pole, outside of Fairbanks. Soon the news media labeled the string of murders the Fairbanks serial murders. Police, as well as civilian and military volunteers, searched for Doris O'Rings and Lori King's bodies near the Johnson Road area where the remains of Wendy Wilson and Marlene Peters had been discovered, but they found no sign of either victim. On September 2, 1981, four airmen on a hunting trip came across the remains of Lori King in a wooded area near a missile site off Johnson Road. Earlier searches had somehow missed this area. The killer had done nothing to hide Lori's body. Like Wendy and Marlene, Lori had been strangled and then shot in the face with a shotgun. Because Lori's body was found on a federal reservation, the FBI joined the case, and a task force was formed consisting of FBI agents, Alaska State Troopers, the Eielson Air Force Base Office of Special Investigations, the Army's Criminal Investigation Division from nearby Fort Wainwright, the Fairbanks Police Department, and the North Pole City Police Department. Investigators now knew they were hunting a dangerous predator who struck frequently, somehow convincing girls and young women to climb into his car where he soon murdered them and then shot them in the face. Some, but not all, of the women showed signs of being raped before they were murdered. Let me take a short break. I want to wish my listeners happy holidays and a thank you. You have no idea how good it makes me feel when someone walks up to me to say they listen to my podcast. When I sit in my tiny studio in the middle of the wilderness, I feel as if no one is listening, and it is very humbling to know you are. Also, thank you to everyone who has sent me story ideas. I hear you. Believe me. I have thick folders of research based on your suggestions. You will hear some of your suggested stories in upcoming episodes, and I am researching others or waiting for additional information. I have received so many leads involving cases of violence against women, and I wish I could do more to write about those. They make me very sad and angry. For relatives of victims whose stories I have covered, I invite you to chat with me. If I have relayed incorrect information, please let me know. I do not want to disrespect you or your loved ones in any way. Again, thank you for listening. You can always message me on Facebook. To better understand how to organize an investigation of this magnitude, Alaska State Trooper investigator Sam Barnard flew to Atlanta, Georgia, where a joint federal and state task force was searching for the serial killer who was murdering young black men in Atlanta. Barnard watched and learned how the Atlanta task force used computer technology to manage and organize the leads in the case. Next, Barnard flew to the FBI Behavioral Sciences Division in Quantico, Virginia, and met with experts there to form a profile of the serial killer operating near Fairbanks. At the time when Barnard consulted them, the FBI Behavioral Sciences Division boasted an 85% success rate for creating accurate profiles of unknown serial killers. The psychologists in the unit must have seemed like wizards, But humans are not machines, and law enforcement agencies soon learned that while FBI profiles could be a useful tool, they were only one of many tools and should not be relied upon completely. 
The profilers told Barnard that the Fairbanks serial killer was probably single and lived alone. They said they believed the perpetrator had a hard time holding a job. And even though Doris Orring's brother stated he thought the man he'd seen talking to Doris wore an Air Force uniform, experts said they believed the murderer was a civilian. Bernard returned to Fairbanks with the unknown killer's profile, and task force members believed they now had something solid for the foundation of their investigation. Why did the murderer shoot the women in the face after he had already strangled them? Psychologists suggested perhaps the killer was repeatedly murdering someone from his past, and he then shot his victims in the face to wipe out their identities. The analysis, whether accurate or not, made it no easier for investigators to find the elusive killer. Trooper Jim McCann and Trooper Chris Stockard undertook the massive task of organizing and entering two and one-half years' worth of information, tips, and physical evidence into the state computers. Then, Stockard, who had a computer training, developed a program to cross-reference the items in the database, prioritizing valuable leads and suspects. An investigator on the task force from the Ileson Air Force Base Office of Special Investigations reported he had identified three individuals on the base who acted inappropriately toward women. One of the three men he identified was Technical Sergeant Thomas Richard Bunday, a 33-year-old electrical expert. Coworkers said Bunday repeatedly showed disrespect toward women, and one woman who worked with Bunday said he was verbally abusive and she was afraid of him. The task force did not dismiss Bunday as a possible suspect, but he was not high on their list because he did not fit the FBI profile in several ways. The profilers believed the murderer would prove to be a civilian who was single, lived alone, and could not hold a job. Bunday was married, had children, and was enlisted in the military, maintaining a good job as an electrician. The task force had identified several suspects who fit the profile better than Bunday did, so they considered Bunday a possible but unlikely suspect. After Lori King was murdered on May 16, 1981, the abductions and murders stopped. One and one-half years later, in November 1982, the task force concluded the murderer was either dead, in prison, in the hospital, or had moved somewhere else. The task force decided they needed to look at military personnel who had been transferred outside the state in the past 18 months. They began scouring the records of recent transfers from Isleson Air Force Base, and they also contacted police agencies near other U.S. Air Force bases around the world and asked them to be on the lookout for and to report any murders similar to the ones perpetrated near Fairbanks. The list of transferred Air Force personnel included the name Thomas Richard Bunday. Bunday had transferred to Shepard Air Force Base near Wichita Falls, Texas, and the transfer happened on September 9, 1981, one week after hunters discovered the body of Lori King near Johnson Road. Wichita Falls police reported they had recently investigated a murder similar to the ones that had occurred near Fairbanks, but police in Texas believed the woman there had been killed by a drug dealer who also was now dead. The task force noted Bunday's resemblance to the drawing made from Doris Oring's brother's description of the man he'd seen talking to his sister. Young Oring immediately identified a photo of Bunday in a lineup and he had no trouble picking out the photo of Bunday's car as the vehicle whose driver he had seen talking to his sister two days before her abduction. Troopers interviewed Bunday's Alaska neighbors and co-workers, and most painted an unflattering picture of Bunday. They described him as an unlikable loner. Bunday had a variety of shotguns and pistols registered to his name. In January 1983, Trooper Sam Barnard flew to Shepard Air Force Base and interviewed Richard Bunday. 
While Bundy agreed to answer Barnard's questions, he refused to take a lie detector test, allow a search of his home, or give samples of his hair. When Barnard told Bundy that Doris Oering's brother had identified a photo of Bundy as the man he had seen talking to his sister, Bundy didn't respond. Barnard returned to Fairbanks and said he did not believe they had solid evidence against Bundy. And since Bundy did not fit the FBI profile, he felt they should investigate other suspects. Most of the task force, though, felt Bundy was their man, and they believed it was time to take a closer look at him. On March 7, 1983, McCann and Stockard flew to Texas, where they met with Texas State and Federal Police, as well as the Air Force's Office of Special Investigations, or OSI. The OSI agreed to place a loose surveillance on Bundy. McCann and Stockard rented two rooms at a local motel for their headquarters, and then asked Bundy to stop by so they could talk to him. Bundy willingly talked to McCann and Stockard and seemed to like the two troopers. The troopers noted Bundy provided only vague responses to their questions, but he never denied killing the women near North Pole. At one point, Bundy made the strange comment, I had trouble with girls in Alaska. McCann and Stockard invited Bundy to return the following day so they could continue their conversation, and Bundy agreed. This time, the troopers punched harder. They told Bundy they knew he'd killed women in Alaska, and they knew how and when he had killed them, but they did not understand why he had killed them. They told him they also knew he had killed a woman in Texas. They knew he was guilty, and they told him he would either spend the rest of his life in an Alaska prison cell or in a Texas cell, where he was likely to face the death penalty. Bundy said little but by the end of the four-hour interview, he began to cry. Bundy returned to the motel the following day for another meeting, but this time he didn't stay. Instead, he handed the troopers a note, denying he had murdered women in Alaska. The following day, McCann, Stockard, an FBI agent, a representative from the Wichita Falls District Attorney's Office, and Shepard OSI observers presented the Bundays with a search warrant and spent 12 hours searching the Bundays' home and vehicles. They found ammunition consistent with the ammunition used in the Alaska murders, newspaper clippings about the Alaska murders, and surveillance-type photos of young girls. Bundy agreed to meet with the troopers at 9 a.m. the following morning, but instead he showed up at their motel at 8 a.m., an hour early, catching the troopers off guard. Bundy confessed to murdering five women in Alaska, including Doris Oring, whose body still had not been found. He told the troopers he had discarded Oring's body in a remote section of Isleson Air Force Base. McCann and Stockard felt helpless. They had no authority to arrest someone in Texas, and the Texas police needed a warrant to arrest someone for crimes committed in Alaska. Bundy told the troopers he would voluntarily return to Alaska with them, but they dared not escort him to Alaska until they had the proper paperwork. Without a warrant for his arrest, they could not restrain Bundy. If he suddenly changed his mind during a stopover in Seattle, they would have no authority to stop him, and they might never be able to find him again. Bundy promised McCann and Stockard he would return to their motel room the following morning, once they had the proper warrants. The following day, the troopers had arrest warrants in hand, but Bundy failed to show up at the agreed-upon time for their meeting. The troopers called Bundy's house, and his wife said Richard was riding his motorcycle, but she expected him to meet her at 1 o'clock that afternoon at the local H&R block office to work on their tax return. The OSI surveillance team waited for Bundy outside the H&R block office, but when Bundy and his wife left the office, the OSI team mistakenly followed her car instead of pursuing Bundy on his motorcycle. 
McCann and Stockard waited impatiently, either for Bunday to arrive at their motel room or for local police to call and say they had Bunday in custody. As they waited, dark clouds rolled over Wichita Falls, and the skies burst with a heavy downpour. Bunday sped out of Wichita Falls on his motorcycle, but when it began to rain, he turned around and started back toward town. He stopped under an overpass, pulled McCann's and Stockard's business cards from his wallet, and placed them carefully on a rock. He then continued on his way, driving at a carelessly fast rate of speed in the pouring rain. When he swerved in front of a large dump truck coming toward him in the other lane, the driver of the truck tried to avoid the collision by turning away from Bunday. But Bunday pursued the truck and crashed into it just behind the cab. Bunday died instantly, and the search for the North Pole serial murderer came to a dramatic end. Analysis of the forensic evidence found at the Bunday home indicated some of the hairs collected from Bunday's truck belonged to Wendy Wilson, and the shotgun shells found in his home were manufactured in the same bunch as the shells used to obliterate the faces of Lori King and Wendy Wilson. In 1986, three years after Bunday's death, and a few months before Doris Orring should have graduated from high school, Doris's skull was found in a remote section of Ileson Air Force Base. When I began researching this case, I read two articles stating that the Thomas Richard Bunday case was one of the first instances where investigators successfully used an FBI profile to identify and catch a murderer. Unfortunately, this statement could not be further from the truth. If not for the misleading psychological profile handed down from the behavioral scientists at Quantico, troopers likely would have identified and captured Bunday much sooner than they did, and possibly even before he left the state of Alaska. This case demonstrates that while a behavioral profile might be useful, it is only one tool, and nothing beats hours of investigation, data collection, forensic evidence, and common sense. Despite a faulty profile, no DNA database, and no national database to compare similar crimes, the dogged investigation by Alaska State Troopers and other authorities involved in this case caught a vicious predator in the era before DNA evidence was king. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you to my patrons for your support. Check out the show notes for more information on how you can support this podcast and unlock extra episodes by joining the Last Frontier Club. If you haven't already done it, be sure to join the Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier Facebook group and chat about the podcast. I'll see you soon for the next episode of Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier.
Pulling up to Mickey D's just for drinks? Oh yeah, that's me. Nothing extra, just perfection and a straw. Coming in hot for the coldest cups on the block. Because there are drinks. Then there are drinks from McDonald's. Mix things up with any size lemonade or sweet tea for $1.49. Perfect with our classic fries. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation? Where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission. At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders. From ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities, CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.